In that relationship, then, we start to bring these things together. We open the gates of wisdom, and we move into this relationship of our deeper journey. And here we have the magus, this planting of the seed. Again, this germ. And it has to do with what the alchemist said, that we are celestial gardeners. Think about ourselves. If your body is not the outcome of just some random mistake, if your body might be the outcome of an arc of an idea that is so profound, so great, that it needs to emanate across the ages, and if we start to think like trees, that these emanations are actually rings in a tree, and that we are the inheritors of all of these rings of capacity, now it is saying we are the critical moment of what story will we tell. And that's why, as I said, even with 9-11, I want to start talking about the mythic implication that what fell away was the binary. What is emerging is the sacred. And that's what creates thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And when this happens, that third eye opens. We're no longer seeing, it's them. No, it's them. No, it's them. <laughs> We're seeing this. Oh, it's them again. There I go as well. I'll choose not to go there now. I'll choose to do what I must do. You see, this is becoming self-redeemed, self-conscious. That's why this is the eye that must open first. This is why we journey through the knowledge of the Father. We journey through the structure, the laws, the principles of the psyche. Because when the blossom <coughs> occurs, when Sophia returns, we will have revealed that the blossoming of wisdom is this eye of Saturn. But why we see all of the different Buddhas, the fem feminine Buddhas, the masculine Buddhas, why do they sit on a thousand petaled lotus? It's not just a symbol of enlightenment. What is a blossom? It is when a quality of consciousness surrenders to the capacity to hold its own greater beauty. Mm. It blossoms for no better reason than it feels right. Mm. Because this is what gets, think about it, from the bud to the blossom. This is what the mind is saying. If you come into me with this focus, you're going to be looking this way. But you've done all that discernment. Now, I want you to realize that no matter how much you allow this sense of wonder, this sense of possibility to open up within you, you now hold a capacity to keep your identity and not be swept away. That's very important. Because for many, many centuries, we were very concerned that if this creative truth emerged, <coughs> we would be swept away into madness. Mm -hmm. But we're finding we're being swept away into madness because we're not letting this happen. <laughs> you see? And that's what I feel so strongly now is the emperor, because the emperor we start to see is not wearing any weapons. He is the grand archetype of days. He is the geometrizer, meaning that he holds the staff of absolute potency of the empress because he is born of the empress. This is a grail truth, that the reason the emperor is born of the empress, the reason the man is reborn through the womb, is that in that relationship, we find that he becomes about the true, uh, you say the true application of what is worthy. He is honoring life, not self-reflection, but the reflection of deeper knowing. This is why the the emperor archetypally has to do with the vision and the eye. But it's a very important type of vision. It's the type of vision that says you will see with these eyes. And these eyes will teach you to be cynical. They'll teach you that people are SOB <coughs> and you've got to be pretty tough. But this eye, this eye will say, wait a minute, it's always tough out there. What does it show you in history when it's tough out there? There are always examples of individuals who said, even though it is dark, even though everyone is looking at me saying, no, 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 you can't, I still say yes. I still say to future generations, even if this one is not listening, we are worthy. We are beautiful. We are the stuff of which dreams are made of. This is what Emerson tells us when he says, for beauty is the creator of the universe. Or Blake tells us when he says, in every bosom, the universe expands its wings. All they're saying is, we are born of a worthiness most unimaginable. And we do such a good job of convincing ourselves we're not, because these eyes tell us accurately well, what are you making out of it? Why are you so up on yourself? Who do you think you are? See, beat back down, beat back down. But that's why, if you think about being beat back down to the point where you finally arise and you say, I will attend a vision of wonder and possibility. I will trust that this 
quality of mind that has been creating me has arisen in me to hold a worthiness of a conversation in time, but also now to hold this sense of wonder of the possibility of eternity. That's when my mind looks out here and says, of course we are one. Of course we are all beautiful blossoms of creation. We are all a unique artistry, a unique knowing. And together, as I say with theater, we prove this every time ensemble occurs. Listen to great musicians. Look at great improvisation. That doesn't come because one person goes, I'm the best. It comes because everybody who shows up goes, you know what, deep down inside, I think I'm the best. <laughs> but you know what that does for actors? It makes them say, what's great is I see your bestness, and I love it. I love the excellence. If I'm a violinist and I look at a cellist that I know has that quality, you know you're going to riff. Because they're not going to get insecure and say, well, I can't do that. And we, we've gotten very good at, I can't do that. And what I see helps us now is to give ourselves permission to look as the emperor, that we're growing out of this great quality to finally allow the phoenix or the quality of, of greater knowing to infuse our, our, our journey. Here we have the chariot, which is the emotional nature. And this is also, though, the relationship of the quality as we see. There is, again, no weaponry here. This is the active principle looking at how do we make sense of the day and night <laughs> day and night. <laughs> oh, boy. That's the simple thing. Um, the, the day and night. But this then holds this fiery chariot and a watery chariot. He does not try to control through anger or through violence, but through holding the eye and the heart that creates the equilibrium, that holds these forces that could devour him, pull him into chaos, at any moment, but it is his willingness to not identify with one or the other, but to rise. And this is what I feel very strongly is that when we think about the left and right, when we energize one or the other, uh, masculine or feminine, what we are doing is actually canceling one wave out. And this is why I always use the metaphor of Fred and Ginger. When we think like that, <laughs> we become dancers of consciousness. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the ancient myths were about creation being danced into being. There's an old Gnostic story of the dancing savior. And then there's a, I mean, it's just a really a, a wonderful.